So yesterday we continued we finished source follower. So now we go with cast code. So cast code will give you a very familiar structure. Suppose we look at M2 first. So and thermal noise of M2. So as far as thermal noise of M2, the reason I started from M2 because it's very familiar. So thermal noise of M2 will appear as a current source between source and drain, random current generator, random current. So if you just look at this structure, this is very similar to in a small signal model, it's very similar to common source with source degeneration. So therefore, you don't need to do anything special, specifically what you know, you know, in fact, first of all, you can just simply use the equivalent input voltage, but that's what we showed last lecture. And then that equivalent input noise voltage now will be at the gate of M2. Now configuration becomes a source degeneration, common source resist, uh, amplifier. M2 becomes the main amplifier and M1 becomes the source degeneration component. And V in is of course ground if we are talking about a low value of ZS. So naturally, you don't need to do anything else. And then just you have this common source, you know the relation. For the gain of the common source with source degeneration, you will give it to the output. And then you will divide it by the gain of the cascode. You will bring it to the input. That becomes the equivalent input noise as far as M2 is concerned. So therefore, one interesting point, another point we we'll learned is that if the resistance of M1 is very large, output resistance, which was the case if we wanted to get the equivalent input noise current of common gate. That was the case when we want to get the equivalent input noise current, this branch was open. And therefore, the noise of M2 was just within a loop and it didn't reach to the load. So same thing is valid here. In fact, if the output impedance of M1 is enough large, the thermal noise current of M2 will, have it, will be within the loop. Therefore, we don't expect too much effect of M2 thermal noise on the noise. However, there is a point here the, at node X, we know that we have a pole and then we have a parasitic capacitor. So this parasitic capacitor as frequency increases will come to the picture gradually. And therefore, the impedance at node X, which was just output resistance of M1, now start in re reducing. So magnitude of the impedance starts reducing. And because of that, then we cannot say that the current noise of M2, channel noise, will loop and will be within this loop only. So now the impedance, which is observed at node X downwards, will start reducing and we cannot ignore. So therefore, we will go with this technique if it is required. I'm saying that in case, for example, you want to derive the equivalent input noise density for a wide range of frequency where effect of capacitance at node X cannot be ignored. In fact, that was one of the applications of cascode. In the applications of cascode was because similar capacitance is removed, therefore bandwidth can be limited to the output. And therefore, because of that, we don't have a very low pull at the input. And that helps us to reduce the effect of Miller capacitance. So anyway, so this is the point. But if frequency is low, therefore naturally effect of thermal noise of M2 will be low. What about other components? Other components are straightforward. Because for M1, equivalent input noise voltage of transistor is known. You can derive it. For RD, directly comes to the output divided by the gain. So, this is a straightforward, that's why I don't spend too much time on it. So therefore, at low frequencies, N2 overall, except of course flicker noise, as far as thermal noise is concerned, M2 doesn't have a significant effect. So these are single stage, simple uh, circuits, hardly constituting two or three transistors and resistors, a couple of resistors.
So overall, it's not very uh, complex or challenging to calculate the equivalent noise. So now we move to differential architectures. Now see what happens for the case of differential circuits. Because actually, the input stage, which is a very important stage for determining the noise, is actually differential. Hardly we use single ended structures at the input. Therefore, we need to have a way to calculate equivalent noise of the differential structures. So, now the question is how to get this to equivalent input noise voltage and equivalent input noise current. At very low frequencies, naturally, again, equivalent input noise current will be low. And we will be limited to equivalent input noise voltage because input impedance of the amplifier is very large. Again, we will follow the same strategy. When we talk about differential amplifier, single stage, any kind of circuit, always we start from simplest case. That's why you see here the simplest possible case of a differential amplifier. So the first question which comes to the mind is that can we use symmetry here or not? First of all, because the very common technique for reducing complexity in the analysis of differential circuits is to use half circuit concept, differential mode, common mode. So now what about this circuit? This circuit has two transistors. And we assume these two transistors generate noises which are not correlated. And this we have already discussed. In fact, assumption that we have in this entire chapter is whatever components we have in the circuit, generated noise in each one of them is uncorrelated to the generated noise in other components. Therefore, do M1 and M2 are corresponding components which should be matched, but they shall have to be matched with respect to them geometry and electrical characteristics. But it doesn't mean that their noise are correlated. Each one of them is a separate physical component. So therefore, first order approximation tells us that there is no correlation between the noise generated in M1 and generated in M2. Same thing is valid for RD. Therefore, here we have four noise sources and actually four uncorrelated noise sources. And if we add the bias current source, then we will have five. So we will have five uncorrelated noise sources. Do we have common mode? Do we have differential mode analysis here or not? What do you think? No. Yeah, that's true. We don't have. The reason is because all these components are uncorrelated. In the sense that if you have look at this circuit at a time equal to T0, for example, you just suppose you record all currents and voltages, instantaneous values, at time equal to T0, freeze time or take a snapshot. And so the voltage you have at the rain of M1 may not be necessarily the same as the rain of M2. This has some instantaneous noise voltage, this node has another instantaneous noise voltage. Similarly, currents, similarly, noise current in R1. So, therefore, here there is no notion of common mode or differential mode. What we need to do is that we need to, the best way of handling this situation is to use superposition. So, we use superposition, we handle the noise of each element in the circuit. Now, because we cannot use common mode or differential mode, for example, in this simple case, when we go with a small signal analysis, so ISS becomes zero. So therefore, this branch is almost open. Let's go with the ideal case, simplest case, and then we will just elaborate. In the other case, VDD will be ground. So therefore, now in these two nodes, VDD node and the source node of M1 and M2, one side we have short circuit, one side we have open circuit. That much we know. And that much is the equivalent circuit. But we cannot talk about equivalent output noise voltage or input noise voltage by considering half circuit. So we will keep the circuit as it is. We don't make any assumption. And then we go ahead with the analysis. But one thing we can understand. If a circuit has a pair of components which are matched, like M1, M2, or RD1 and RD2, which are called RD here, 
if you have a noise source in RD and you have a noise source in another RD, impact of each one of them at the input or an output is expected to be same because circuit is same for both of them. The equivalent circuit becomes same. So that much we expect and we understand that situation is valid here. So therefore, if I look at this scenario and then for now, for example, the noise of the current source is ignored, but even if it is there, actually it's one of the special cases of this case that I will talk about it. So we will have five noise sources, four of them are shown here. The fifth one, which is the noise coming from the current source will be just a simple current source connected between P and ground. Uh, for example, thermal noise current, channel of the bias transistor, tail current source. So see, here we have four of them and they are not correlated. So therefore, we emphasize they are not correlated. Therefore, concept of a small signal ground, for example, in differential mode. There is no differential mode. Therefore, there is no concept of a small signal ground. So, if we at least consider for simplicity output resistance of the tail current source is very large, so we can consider node P is almost, uh, is connected almost to an open circuit if we look downwards. That much we can say. And another point is that the circuit will have same configuration as far as IN1 and IN2 are concerned. As far as INRD1 and INRD2 are concerned, therefore, if you derive the equivalent input noise voltage for one of these current sources, we expect to get again same power spectral density or average noise power for the circuit either at the output or input for the, for the corresponding noise source on the other side. Okay, now how to proceed? What we do is that we proceed with the superposition because we have four noise sources and we know that Whatever we get for IN1 will be valid for IN2. Therefore, it's enough to calculate for IN1 and then just use superposition to get for IN1 and IN2. Similarly, we can calculate or derive for RD1 and then move ahead and then include it also for RD2, similar situation. But here there are little, you know, uh, techniques to apply. One technique, of course, will be just to start write KVL KCL. Again, when you write KVL KCL, you never learn how to analyze the circuit. Therefore, we try to uh, move a little with the, in a systematic approach, with a systematic approach and try to simplify the circuit as much as possible. So, I draw the circuit because this differential amplifier is an important concept. When you learn it, then at least you have learned again one more concept similar to single stage amplifiers. And then you can apply to the situ different situation. So this node is open, node P. Therefore, I don't draw anything connected between node P and AC ground. So here now we want to calculate equivalent input noise voltage. And at low frequencies, therefore, gates will be anyway grounded. And right now, we want to calculate the effect of thermal noise of the channel for transistor M1. So it's thermal noise, therefore we can talk about average power. If it was not, we have to talk about or we have to analyze for power spectral density, not average power. So be careful. So we can, therefore, we talk about average power. When is because it's a low frequency analysis. And second point, anyway, we deal with with white noise. Otherwise, instead of average power of IN, IN, we will talk about the power spectral density. But analysis is same. 
Okay. So to be more systematic, we see that what we can do. So one of the things that we can do here is, so there are different techniques. So I go with different techniques and then uh, ask you one technique, you follow one technique, I will follow. Okay. I will take, the, I will use the superposition uh, to derive the effect of four sources. Here, I don't use whatever we have learned. The main reason is that because I want you purposefully to see that what is happening if you have to do that kind of analysis. Therefore, I purposefully choose an analysis where you have a little bit about different aspects of this kind of analysis so that in a circuit, which is not very much familiar to you as far as other circuits are concerned that we have learned till now, right? Therefore, what to do with that? See, one thing, if you face a circuit which has a current source between two nodes and you cannot convert it to common source with source degeneration because this circuit, first of all, the first quick solution which comes to mind is that if you look at this circuit, if I just turn this branch by 90 degree, so this entire branch is a part of source of M1. Therefore, now you have a common source with source degeneration scenario. So therefore, you can use that. And here, the impedance is not low, right? The impedance is not low, it's not high. The impedance you see from source of M1. Therefore, we cannot say that effect of channel noise of M1 is negligible. So therefore, it will be in the picture. So this is the first point. And the second point is that we learned that if we have a common source with source degeneration, we can uh, remove this current and then convert it to a voltage source at the input, right? Which will be IN1 upon GM1. Okay. So keep this in mind and then we'll move and then see that what would be the uh, case. So therefore, if I go ahead and just redraw the circuit, I redraw it in that way. Though it is not a convenient way of drawing, but this is just to show that it is the same circuit. So as long as you, ha if you have a shunt current source and you can model the circuit using a common source with degeneration, so your job is done. Not completely, of course, but relatively. See, because we are interested to look at the equivalent input noise at the source of M1. Eventually, we are looking at the equivalent noise at the source of M1 will be in the form of differential. So this part becomes the source degeneration. This part is load. And the impedance is not very high. Therefore, I can con write it, show it in, that, in this way. This is M1. I don't show this block. I just show it by a black box. And this side is RD1. So now I can bring the noise voltage source here and then I can call it Vn, symbol I have used. This is noise due to M1. And that noise due to M1 was noise, channel noise current due to M1 divided by GM1 square. So therefore, it will be 4KT multiplied by 
two by three multiply by one upon g m one. Fine. So therefore, it is very important to learn and use the facts that we are, we know, theorems, lemma, whatever we know. Now here, I don't uh, finish this part quickly to say, okay, so we know effect of M1, similarly we will have effect of M2 and so on. Let's uh, just revisit this analysis and that is one important point I want to tell you. See, sometimes you may not get this configuration and then you have to go with analysis. One thing which will help you is this theorem. That's why I want you to also uh, be, uh, in fact, aware of this theorem. If you have a current source between two nodes, say nodes N1 and N2, and this current source suppose is shown by IS, it can be anything. So you can have an equivalent circuit where you remove the current source from these two nodes and then you add it here between every node and ground and the direction of the current is exactly according to the direction you had in the main circuit. For example, for node N1, it's a sink current, therefore you have to use a sink current. For node N2, It's a source current, it uh, flows outwards, therefore you will draw an outwards. Direction here matters a lot. In fact, if you make a mistake in the directions, then your results will be wrong. These two circuits are equivalent. Therefore, as long as you have complexity or you see it's very complex to um, analyze the circuit using this kind of current source connected between two nodes and you want to convert it to single ended current source, you do use this. Because when you convert to, what is the advantage? When you convert to single ended current source, you can easily multiply the current source by the impedance you see from each node. And that's why it gives you a very uh, simple way of handling this situation. However, be careful, the directions have to be taken care. The reason I told this is that if you face this kind of situation, which may happen a lot in the circuits, and then you may not get that equivalent source degeneration, here was a straightforward. What you do is that you connect this current source between every node and ground. So I just tell you here how you proceed and then what again you need to consider. So therefore, here we use this theorem. Now look, this theorem is not applicable for IS square. This theorem is applicable for IS. Therefore, when we want to apply it to a circuit which has noise, we have to apply it to IN, not IN square. So this is very important. So that is, that's why I emphasize and I, I purposefully mention this example so that you be aware. Suppose, suppose I don't know or I'm not aware of this lemma that I can use this simplification and then bring it here. This was proved last lecture. So let's, what you will do? What you, what you can do is that you can simplify the circuit. To simplify the circuit, you can convert it to two current noise sources. So you may ask, okay, what direction I have to consider? So you consider any direction you want, but take care of direction in both of them. For example, if you plot the current noise here, which is flowing outwards from drain of M1, when you want to connect it to the source of M1, you can draw it inwards. And the remaining part is connected to M2 and RD2. So here we don't say I n square, we say I n. Why? Because we have one current source at every instant of time 
we have a corresponding value for this current. Though it is a random value, but it has a value. And this value will be same if you use that equivalent circuit. And therefore, this value will flow into a node and will flow out of another node. So therefore, the same situation at time instant t has to be valid. That's why when you use equivalent circuits in the noise, considering noise, still you be careful about directions. And you analyze the circuit just in simple current or voltage domain. When you are done with the analysis, then you convert it to power. But if you right away convert it to power, you will lose current information and then you won't be able to get correct results. This was one point that I wanted to mention. And then when you reach to this situation, again because it's a linear analysis, you can still within this analysis use superposition. For example, make the first current here 0 and then you have this IL. Calculate the whatever you want. For example, you want to calculate voltage here, so you calculate it. Or you want to calculate voltage at the output, you calculate. Similarly, then you keep this 0 and then apply current here. And then you add voltages. This is superposition in voltage domain. And then you take power. When you take power, then results will naturally, the whatever Vn you have will be omitted, only Vn square will remain. So, in fact, I did this analysis as well, specifically on the purpose, just to sh you show that how this analysis can lead to the results. Though it was time consuming for me, but I did, yes. That's why, that's why here you are not using any noise or power domain analysis. This is current domain analysis. And superposition is in current domain. So you will simplify here, you will get one voltage, which is a function of IN. That's it. And then now you can move to power domain. So therefore, till the last point, which is the superposition, you are not converting anything to current, to power. These are all current domain analysis. So this analysis, Text, uh, I needed to explain this, otherwise it would, would have not been clear for you. So therefore, anyway, we know the straightforward way. But this is a very important fact, because sometimes you may need to use it, and therefore, you need to be aware that you cannot use, and that is correct. It's the same current. Therefore, they are correlated. We cannot use power. But at the same time, we can use voltage. We don't use superposition. We use superposition in the current domain, not in the power domain here. This is superposition in the current domain. You use superposition in the current domain only just we want you make it simple to get the output voltage or input voltage. When you get that voltage, then you can use power. Superposition in power domain. In current domain, of course. This is current linear superposition. There is no question of correlation, uncorrelation. This is a simple current source, linear circuit with current source, superposition, that's it. Correlation comes to the picture when you talk about the statistical characteristics. Here it is, you analyze it just like a deterministic analysis. It's like that we are looking at this circuit at a particular time. Time is frozen. No, we don't consider, theorem tells us. That's why it is according to theorem. It's an instantaneous value. This is just instantaneous value. That's why this is just a superposition in current domain, not in power domain. His question is about power domain and saying that we are not applying in power domain. That's why I don't write IN square, I write IN. And it can be an instantaneous value of time. This is, you may not apply it. Even if you don't, you just analyze this circuit altogether. There is no question of superposition. Superposition is just because it gives you a faster solution, one by one. This is very common in linear circuits. That's it. In fact, here, I have done the same thing. See, look, here I talk about Vn. I don't talk about Vn square. So it's exactly the same thing. So what is this? This is, for example, In1, right? So we divide it into two parts. So, and each one of them 
will uh, be considered in this way. One is connected at the drain, one is connected at the source. So I'll go with the first one, for example, and then I ignore the one which is at the source, at the drain. See, if I make this zero, so this is superposition in current domain. So if I this make this zero, so you have two symmetric circuits and you have a current source. So it's equivalently will be divided by two. That's why I have written I n by two. So this is just you have this circuit, now you go with simple linear analysis. So therefore, when I say I n 1 n 1 and I n 1 2 means that that is voltage due to one of the components of I n 1 which is connected between source and ground and 2 is the other component of I n 1 which is connected between drain and ground. One is connected between source and ground, one is connected between drain and ground and see here all everywhere I am taking care of the sign also. It's all in voltage and current domain. This is not in power domain. And therefore, when I go with superposition also, see, till the last step, I don't make any power. This is just a calculation of the, for example, differential output voltage, divide it by the gain, bring it to the input, you know. Like, for example, when you reach here, see, differential output voltage, for example. Now, I have calculated it is IN12 into RD1. So it's done. Now we have we have it, right? Now when we finished it, then we can apply the equivalent input noise power or equivalent output noise power. Now I can just take, for example, the average power from both sides. Okay. So this is just wanted to tell you like you will reach to the same results that we reached here. So what we did is that we used, of course, common source with source degeneration. Therefore, it was a straightforward. Even if we don't do that, using the same detail analysis, we will reach. But here the beauty of this example is now you will get another useful theorem to apply. Another useful theorem to apply when you can divide the current source to two current sources and then shunt current sources between every node and ground and then you will take care of sign as well. So directions are taken care. Okay. So now this is what we got. We got it for the input, so then we can multiply it by RD, we'll go to the output. That is also straightforward. But here anyway, this is proved at the output. So that's why I have written at the output and then I have divided by the key. So here there is one point. The point is that you have two noise sources. So one is IN1 square and one is IN2 square. So both of them will give you an equivalent noise voltage at the input as well as output. So therefore, I can write at the output, same thing I got for IN1 for IN2 because circuit is same for both. Therefore, if for output voltage noise, I get RD square into IN2 square, IN1 square average, I will get same thing for IN2. That's why I have written them together. And they are uncorrelated, therefore I will add powers at the output power of two current sources, generated power to two, two current sources at the output. And we have, of course, the thermal noise of RD1 and RD2. That is a straightforward because that they will be series with RD1 and RD2. The effective impedance we see between the rain of M1 and the rain of M2 is very large. It is RO1 plus RO2. We saw that, right? Whenever you have this circuit, effectively, Equivalent impedance is RO1 plus RO2. That is much larger than RD1 plus RD2. Therefore, the effective noise you see at the output due to RD will be 4KT RD for each one of RD values. You have two of them, so it will get multiplied by two. 
multiply by 2 is like summation of them, they are uncorrelated, therefore, average of multiplication of them will be 0. So, therefore, it will be simplified to this term and then when we want to convert it to the input, so we know the gain is g m r d, so therefore, we just divide it by g m square r d square. Now, it is a very interesting point. We did not use any uh, half circuit, but at the end of the day, the equivalent input noise is two times of the equivalent input noise of a single common source amplifier with passive load. Though we did not use any half circuit, but practically we get similar results. Okay. Now, th this was the point I told you. Like now, if you assume you have a tail current source, so tail will be straightforward now. So, for the tail current source, this is the situation. This is the same condition when you have only I n. Now, because I told you this analysis, now if you have a tail current source and the equivalent output noise current of that current source will flow here. So, what will happen is this noise current will be equally divided into two branches will reach to the outputs. So, therefore, each one of these outputs will observe this noise. So, I will write tail. So, this is the average power of noise. Suppose we are talking about thermal noise, similarly it will have flicker noise. So, for the thermal noise, it will be this is output noise power due to thermal noise power of the tail current source. So, this current will be divided by 2 and then will flow through each one of them. So, therefore, you will have I n by 2 into R d 1 which is R d plus I n by 2 into R d and this is a square average. So, this will be the equivalent noise that you will get. Eventually, if each one of these branches will see half of the current, so one fourth of the power. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay, okay. Right. This is I N one. You are right, you are right, these are correlated. Okay. So, this is for the tail current source. And you can divide it by gain, bring it to the input. divided by g m square or d square. So, it will be divided by g m square. That will give you the equivalent g m 1 square. That will be equivalent voltage. Okay. So, this is for the 
tail current source and here of course, it is only related to internal noise sources. So, the first term here is related to thermal noise of the transistors and resistors, which is twice of the average noise power of common source. Intuitively, we expect that because we have double of components, eventually we have two common sources. Double of components, we accept, expect to get double of the power. And if you have flicker noise, because flicker noise is right at the input of transistor. So, we do not need to do anything. We just add the power spectral density of flicker noise. So, this is actually I have to correct it. This is power spectral density, not average power. In your notes, be careful. I will correct this as well. Any question? Yeah, similarly, of course, one thing is effect of flicker noise of current source is same thing. What I wrote here is valid about flicker noise as well. So, if the current source, in fact, that was the point I told you about oscillators. Because if they have that kind of tail current source and then that flicker noise of this current source will enter into the tank circuit and then will change the current which is injected into the tank. So, that will modulate the frequency. That is the reason that we see this uh, flicker noise to uh, jitter or phase noise conversion. So, if, if I n has flicker noise component is exactly will be same because here actually I did not make any assumption. And this is just the average power, but I did not say what is that average power. Now, it depends what is the equivalent noise the spectral density of this I n. Eventually, power spectral density of noise at the output will be R d square power spectral density of noise current. So, I can write it in that way. Let us call this tail. So, this is power spectral as a function. So, same thing will be valid for the flicker noise. <coughs> Ratio of R d by 1 g m also plays an important role because when g m R d or eventually R d upon 1 upon g m is large, so you will get better attenuation and that is also true which is because Effectively, noise will get divided by gain. We'll come to the input. See, first of all, uh, most of the time, hardly you need to generate any voltage. You mainly mirror the current. So don't call it voltage generation. You always mirror the current because most of the structures you have are biased by current source. That is that is different. I was going to reach. There. So, no. So, most of the time you mirror the current. Now, in some applications like data converters, comparators, this is a kind of comparator. You need to have a reference level. In that case, you generate the VREF. Now, the question is that whether you want that VREF to be independent of temperature and process or you do not want. If you want to be independent, where you want to be independent is in data converters. Reference levels have to be very accurate. That is why you go with the best way of generating reference, which is based on the band gap combination of VBE, VT. There are various circuits. But if you want that voltage to follow process or temperature, because the input voltage itself follows and you do not, these two you want to be detected, then you will generate PTAT voltage, CTAT voltage, 
with respect to temperature, you will generate the voltage from threshold voltage which will follow the process as well. So, it all depends on the application. Here in this particular case, if you want your reference to be a function of VDD, because if you change VDD, you may want to change your common modulus. Then it's better to generate reference from VDD. So that if your VDD changes, your reference changes, your common mode accordingly always will be a fraction of well known fraction of VDD. Suppose you want always to keep common mode at 60 percent of VDD. So you generate VREF to be 60 percent of VDD. But can we use a series combination of active loads and then like voltage divider we can have, we can take out different voltage. You mean diode connected yeah. transistor? Yes, you can use diode connect. That is a kind of divider. So as long as they are of the same type, so that when you change the process, division ratio doesn't change. That's okay. See, one thing also you always look is that how much power that branch draws. If you use diode connected, make sure you use enough number of them, so that you will not have too much current. Or aspect ratio should be very low, so that not just a lot of current you spend just to generate that VDD divided by K. So, in this particular application, for example, in your project, it is better to generate reference from VDD because when your VDD changes, your common mode level still will have same ratio with respect to VDD. So, here band gap is not a right choice. Any further question? So, The one is common mode feedback, one is main amplifier, and one is bias network. If you don't need, no. As long as you can stabilize the common mode level, that's good enough. If one stage needs, just one stage. Okay, anything else? I think current source is the best choice. The advantage of current source is that, see, eventually for bias always, we go with current, we go with gate over the right, we get during design, we go, we get the sizing. So for generation of, for biasing also, we go with the same way. So I have design based on a current, so I bias with the same current. So it is a better choice unless you have to. Voltage based biasing does not see you want to have a common source, right? How do you want to use voltage biasing to bias? And what is the advantage? Okay, you may get some advantage. Yes, so see you have an active load. That active load will be your bias current generator as well as it will behave like an active load will give you enough gain. And then you mirror the current from the input stage. For differential, uh, voltage gap we are using CMLB, but for common source, what will be used? No, but that is a single stage, right? A single stage. Single stage. Then you don't need because whatever you get at the output when you use the feedback, naturally you will set the DC level. You will use this up-pump in a feedback loop. So that feedback loop will give you a bias imposed on the output voltage. We'll set it. If you use it in open loop, of course, you don't have any way to stabilize the output. But as soon as you apply the feedback, that also includes a common mode feedback. See, when you apply a feedback around the up-pump, you have also a common mode feedback, naturally. So that naturally you will get a stabilized common mode. This is valid for all op-amps. Output might be high impedance, but when you close them, say a simple source uh, voltage follower or a simple amplifier with two resistors. So what you are doing is that first of all you apply feedback, therefore output in shunt feedback, therefore output impedance will drop. And the second point is that as far as DC by yourself, the op-amp is concerned now, you define a common mode level at the input and that naturally because of feedback will be imposed at the output. So this will be set. 
you do not need really. So, suppose simple, simple differential amplifier followed by a common source. It is a simple example with active load. You think the output voltage of the common source cannot be stabilized. So, you need a common mode feedback. No, here you do not need. Here, because there is no question of fighting currents with each other and it is not possible to determine the voltage. That here, that will you can mirror the current from a current source. You have a bias current source. Input, you do not give input, you mirror the current. So, you mirror the current for the active load and then you transfer the signal to the driver. So, you have a driver, you have a load. Load is your bias current source as well. And then the signal will come to the input of driver, right? Therefore, the bias input of the driver will determine the DC level of the previous stage because previous stage also is a high impedance stage. It's difficult to stabilize or well define the DC level there. This will define, and the DC level at the output will be defined by the common mode level that you apply from outside. This leads some offset. The reason is that because you may have any common mode level, therefore the Corresponding to this common mode level, you will see some small offset at the input, which is called systematic offset. Because common mode level is not only a one level, you can have many levels, but only one of them will give you exactly the zero input, zero equivalent input. So, a little bit you change the say DC input, the DC output will change. So, that is equivalent system called systematic offset voltage, because you mirror all currents from same source. And then if you want exactly to be able to make the say first differential amplifier, suppose. Suppose differential amplifier, you want to make the two outputs exactly same. Suppose it is a single stage with a local internal common mode feedback. So, but we are saying that the output of the first stage DC voltage will be determined by the bias input of the second stage. So, you will get a mismatch. That mismatch is the systematic offset. If that bias voltage is in such a way that it is exactly equivalent or equal with the other output voltage of the differential amplifier, then you get perfectly zero input offset. But that is okay, that a small systematic offset exists. But that gives you the leverage of adjusting the common mode level as long as the output stage does not go beyond linear region, linear operation, not linear region, linear operation. So, you mirror the current and then if you, you have just a, see, distinguish these two cases. One case is that, what is the output impedance? Is it high or is it low? Can I determine the DC level at the output? So, I can apply the feedback and then do it. Simple global feedback. The second point is that when you want to bias, you may not be able independently determine the value of currents. And one of them becomes dependent on others. In that case, you need common mode feedback. Internal common mode feedback, not global. Because otherwise, you are not able to determine value of currents. And therefore, now, and most of the time, output voltages, output nodes are high impedance nodes. They are very sensitive to mismatch between currents. And therefore, it changes. Output DC voltage changes a lot. In that case, you need. You cannot enforce. But when you have just a high impedance node, that simply you can enforce because there is no fight anywhere. Everything will be adjusted. But these two are not exactly the same, and sometimes the other is the question what is the difference between nature of these two? Whatever always you look in that way, if in your circuit you can adjust the voltage level using a global external feedback, which is the right way of using your op amp, that is good enough. But if you cannot, then you need to have a local common mode feedback to control the bias current and therefore DC level. Because DC level at the output is very sensitive to the mismatch between bias current. So, it does both, job for, both jobs for you. You enforce the DC level, naturally current also will get adjusted to give you that DC voltage. That is what common mode feedback does. And for the first case, that is what the global feedback does. In both cases, after all, there is a feedback. Okay.